Well, I'm glad to be with you this morning, so I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 11, and my assignment is provoking Israel, and the text I've been given is Romans chapter 11, verse 11 through 24. Now, if there was anything I struggled with in the light of the assignment was basically just phrasing it or wording it in a manner that I can talk about it. And um, the, the issue for me about this topic, provoking Israel, now let me just read you what my assignment is. It says, a study of the special aspect of Paul's Gentile ministry, designed to provoke lost Jews to emulate Gentiles and get saved into the body of Christ, and how Gentiles should not boast against Israel during this time. And again, that's Romans 11, 11 through 24. Now, this subject, for me, provoking Israel, is the, in my judgment, is the only proper explanation for Paul's Acts ministry. And there's a lot of questions uh, and a lot of confusion re re revolving around Paul's Acts ministry. But in addition to being the proper exp explanation for Paul's Acts ministry, provoking Israel is also should be seen as the gradual unfolding of the mystery. Now, for me, again, this information is vital, and it provides a solution to that problem of looking at Paul's early Acts ministry. Uh, there's a lot of things in Paul's ministry that leads others to conclude on the one hand, if you take the Acts 2 position, for example, they see Paul's ministry as just simply a continuation. And that's due to the fact that I don't believe they understand that provoking ministry of the Apostle Paul. Yeah. The Acts 28 concludes that the mystery, the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace could not begin until the end of the act, Acts 28. And again, that's due principally, I believe, to a failure to understand the provoking ministry of the Apostle Paul, the provoking of Israel. Now, and, and so you, you, you and, and by the way, there, there are some you know, I've heard a uh, lack of, um, or, well, I don't know if I call it a lack of content contentment with the phrase mid acts dispensationalists. I don't know how else to refer to it. Uh, when I use the phrase, I'm, you know, you got Acts 2, you got Acts 28, we're in the middle. <laughs> so for me, that's what mid acts means. You know, we're not Acts 2, we're not Acts 28. If you use the expression Pauline, you, we talk about dispensationalists, but then if you talk about Pauline dispensationalists, maybe as a term that would describe or define the mid-acts position, it might be a, a little bit more. And I have found that there are some, what I would call Pauline dispensationalists, that are, again, I believe due to a failure to understand the mid-acts, not the mid-acts, but the provoking ministry of the Apostle Paul, are either tilting toward the Acts 2 arguments or tilting toward the Acts 28 arguments in undermining you know, the mid-acts or the Pauline dispensational 
view. And that is causing the problem. But I believe it all stems from, again, a lack of understanding of Paul's provoking ministry, uh, as Paul refers to here in Romans 11, 11 through 24. Uh, so let's look at um, Romans 11. And one of the things that I, I would draw your attention to there, beginning in verse 11, Paul says, I say then. And when I see that expression, um, I, I think of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 7. When Paul says, consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding in all things. So when he says, I say then, he's giving you the Pauline perspective. And when it comes to understanding the word of God today, you have to have the Pauline perspective. If you look back at 1 Corinthians, well, I tell you what, before we go there, go, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, or chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, in order to appreciate when Paul says, I say then, and I think oftentimes that is often glossed over uh, by preachers and teachers of the word of God. In verse 15 and 16, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. There in verse 16, Paul talks about that in me first. There's a sense in which Paul is first, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8. There's a sense in which Paul is last. Paul is both first and last in something. And that first and last in something is what gives great weight or should give great weight to his words when he says, I say then. And it should be something that we should, you know, our ears should perk up and be very attentive to. You know, the, the old commercial when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens, it gets quiet. <laughs> well, when Paul speaks, everybody should listen because he's both first and last in something. In, in 1, uh, 1 Timothy 1, he's the first to be saved. Now, I know that might be quite striking to those that are outside of our particular fellowship. But in 1 Timothy 1.15, the context is salvation. And in that context, Paul says, I am the first Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? Save sinners, of whom he says, I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain, that in me first. So Paul is the first to get saved. But he also says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, he's last in something, and he says, and last of all, he was seen of me as of one born out of due time. So being both first and last should give great weight to the words and to the writings of the Apostle Paul, to the teachings of Paul, to the doctrines of Paul. And it's no wonder that Paul would say often throughout his epistles, throughout his writings, or put the emphasis that no one should teach other than what he has taught. That his doctrine governs, his teaching governs the faith today. Determines what the faith is. Define what the faith is. What the truth is 
in this dispensation. So when he says, I say then, he's given you the Pauline perspective. He's given you a per he's given you an understanding. And he's taken, and by the way, he, he's looking at he has to look back at the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the ministry of the 12 apostles. And then he has to look and he has to interpret their ministry and then he has to interpret his own ministry to the world. And that's what he does. We talk about some keys to understanding the Bible. Well, this is one of those keys to understanding the New Testament. But in these keys, Paul is interpreting his ministry. He's not only interpreting his ministry, but he interprets others. He, he interprets the ministries with regards to the past. He interprets the ministries regard, with regards to the present. And he interprets the ministries with regards to the future. Romans 15, 8, looking back at the Gospels, he interprets the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here in Romans 11, 11, and 12, he's interpreting... Uh, the ministry of the 12 apostles, um, looking back at their ministry. And when I say that, he's, he's, he's interpreting for you the book of Acts. And it is Paul's Acts ministry, again, that we are concerned about here. So when he says, I say then, have they stumbled, now he's looking back in time past, have they stumbled, that is a reference to the nation of Israel, have they stumbled that they should fall? Israel stumble, but they don't fall. He says, God forbid. He's looking back at the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what that ministry presented to the nation of Israel. And that ministry was a, was a stumbling stone for Israel. Israel could not identify with the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons they could not is because they were focused on the kingdom, they were focused on the glory of that kingdom. They were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for a savior like David and like Solomon. If you look back at First Peter, First Peter chapter one. And beginning at verse eight, whom that is Jesus Christ, having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now watch what he says. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, following uh, John the Baptist as an introduction of his ministry, of an introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was great demonstration, the miracles, the signs, and the wonders and yet, in spite of all of that, the nation of Israel did not believe, did not receive him. Now, at some point in Christ's ministry, he changed the direction. 
the focus of his ministry. From being about the kingdom of being at hand to now going to the cross. And that was really a problem for the Jews. Not, you know, notwithstanding the problems they had with his ministry up to that point, even more so, and, and his looking to the cross was even a problem, even an obstacle for the little flock, for the kingdom church, the kingdom saints. They couldn't wrap their mind around the direction in which Christ's ministry took because these are things that they did not understand, did not know. But when Peter talks about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, it was the sufferings of Christ, especially when Christ began to say even to the, the little flock that he must go to Jerusalem and be put to death. They totally was at odd with that idea. Peter says in, in, in Matthew, um, basically, this, this is not going to happen. I'm paraphrasing now because I can't remember the exact words that Peter used. Then Peter began to rebuke him. Now, that's how not getting what the Lord was telling them Peter, to the degree that, they, that Peter rebuked the Lord. Now, that, that's kind of bold, that you would rebuke the Lord. And the Lord re, re, replied, he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense of me, unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And so... Christ was a stumbling block. And when he went to the cross, most certainly Israel stumbled. That was the only time they had to, the opportunity to stumble. Behold, I lay in Zion a, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And so what we're seeing here in Romans 11, 11, and 12, and by the way, although I'm going back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but leading up to the cross, as when they stumble, they stumble, but they don't fall. But what you have in Romans 11, 11, and 12, you have to account for the stumble, the fall, and the diminishing of the nation of Israel. And so Romans 11, 11, and 12 begins to, uh, is, is, rather, is rather a, a key to understanding what's going on in the book of Acts. And there is something going on in the book of Acts both in the first part of the book of Acts and in the latter part of the book of Acts. And whether you're talking about the first part or the second part, what's happening in the book of Acts is a provoking by God of the nation of Israel. If you look back at Romans chapter 10, there's a provoking, as you've heard others say already, there's a, provo there's a provoking of Israel according to prophecy. And then there is a provoking of Israel according to the revelation of the mystery. But all in all, throughout the book of Acts, what God is doing is provoking that nation. Now, when he's provoking them according... Well, let's look at Romans 10 here first. Uh, verse... Um, Verse 19. Well, let's start at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Talking about Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. They have not, um, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For, for Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends 
of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that ask not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, a member of the message explains this long-suffering of God. Back in, in that long-suffering, by the way, it was salvation. Now, there are a number of things to be said about that, but just in generally speaking, in Romans 2, for example, when... Paul writes there, he talks about despising the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That long-suffering, that all day long have I stretched out my hands unto a, to a disobedient and gainsaying people, because God's desires for them to repent, God's desires for them to be saved. And so as God uses the little flock, Let's go back to, to Romans 10. Let me finish reading. Uh, at least emphasizing the point there in verse 19. When he says, first, I, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. All too often the commentaries misinterpret that as being Gentiles. But it doesn't say Gentiles. It doesn't say nations. It do, it's not plural. It's singular. A foolish nation. And if you say it's a Gentile nation, you have to ask yourself, which Gentile nation? Okay. But it's a foolish nation. Well, beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist, God began to separate out unto himself a people. To separate out himself a people from the apostate nation. Look back at John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, verse 1, we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd, of the sheep. Now the sheepfold began to be formed before the shepherd of the sheep entered into the sheepfold through the door himself. It began with John the Baptist. Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. And John came preaching the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And those who submitted to John's baptism were separated out from the nation. And they made up this sheepfold. The door was the baptism of John, water baptism. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Okay? That door into that sheepfold was water baptism, the baptism of John to be specific. The Lord Jesus Christ enters through that door himself, as John chapter 1 explains, to be identified as the Christ, as Israel's Messiah. But that's where that little flock, that little, that new community of believers began to be formed. 
they constitute the kingdom messianic church that Christ spoke of in Matthew 16 when he says upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is a separating out of a people unto himself. If you look back at Matthew 21, in Matthew chapter 21, speaking to the nation of Israel. By the way, the nation of Israel was a church as well. They were the church in the wilderness, Acts chapter 7 and 38. That's a reference to Israel as a nation. But speaking to those, those people, um, Well, let's just start at verse 42 for the sake of time. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, the nation. the apostate nation, and given to, notice what he says there, given to a nation, bringing forth, forth the fruits thereof. Look over at Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, it's easy to identify that nation to whom the Lord says the kingdom would be given. In verse 32, he says, fear not, little flock. Again, that's that sheepfold. That's those believers who are separated out, identified by the baptism of John. The baptism of John is a baptism that was essential for the Jews to submit to in order to be identified with or to confess or to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I, 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 I wanted to emphasize this for the simple reason that when you get to Acts or you get to the post-resurrection commission, and Christ instructing the apostles to continue or to go forth continuing to baptize, that that's not a new baptism being sanctioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the same baptism with the same designs. That is, uh, one, it was to confess Jesus as to Christ, the Son of the living God, but also, well, well just that, to, to, to identify Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to be uh, identified with that new community of believers. Because that's where salvation was, was among the little flock, with the little flock. Verse 31, so when he, uh, verse 32, so when he says, fear not, little flock, again, that's that new community of believers separated out by the baptism of John, identifying Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now in Matthew 21, He's going to take the kingdom away from the religious leaders of Israel and give it to a nation to bring forth the fruits thereof. Well, it's easy, again, to identify who the, who the a nation is. It's the little flock. 
It's the kingdom church. Going back to uh, Romans 10. And it is that community of believers in the early part of the book of Acts God uses to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now that provoking doesn't just start in the book of Acts. It continues because that provoking began again with John the Baptist ministry and the calling out of of believers from the apostate nation. And as you know, that the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than being something that endeared itself to the nation of Israel, was provoking. That started in the Gospels. When you come to the book of Acts, it is not the beginning of something new. It is the continuation of something that had already begun, was already up and running, well, on, well in, in progress. But that kingdom church, you might say, if anything comes into its, what's the word I'm looking for? Comes into maybe its full identity with the baptism with the, of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Because that was the enduing them with power to go out and do that work of bringing the nation of Israel to the feet of the Messiah. But what you want to understand about the provoking ministry in the, in, at, in the book of Acts, in the early part of the book of Acts, by that little flock, by the kingdom messianic church, it had in view the salvation of the nation. God was seeking to fulfill his promise to the nation of Israel. But Israel had to receive what God was presenting to them, what God was offering them. They rejected it under John's ministry. They rejected it under Christ's ministry. And now you come to the spirit-filled apostles. And what we discover, what we find is that Israel rejects even that offer. But when you come into the book of Acts, it, again, it is not the beginning, beginning of something new. It is continuing the prophetic program. It is looking forward uh, and has in view the salvation of the nation of Israel, which will be brought about by the Urshwing in, uh, rather, the second coming of Christ, coming back with the kingdom to establish it upon the earth. That's the view of God's provoking in the early parts of the book of Acts. But when Israel continued to reject it, now I want you to go to Acts chapter 14. Acts, make that Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, Now, there's a lot in Acts 13. I mean, the whole chapter has a lot of information, and, and I think everybody has already expressed the, the sentiment that uh, with what they have to cover and the time they have to cover it. <laughs> Just, you know, who was that? Uh, Greg was talking about Mission Impossible. <laughs> a lot of territory to cover. In Acts 13, uh, somebody mentioned the, uh, the blinding of um, Sergius Paulus, called it, I uh, forgot what they called it. Um, but anyway, they made reference to it, the blinding of a Jew and, the, uh, and of a Gentile getting saved. Um, but what I want you to see here is that When Israel rejects the ministry 
of the Twelve Apostles. The next event or the response to that rejection would have been the wrath of God. That would have been the next event on, in, in the prophetic program. In Matthew 3.11, John gives a simple outline. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but there come one after me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, Pentecost, and with fire. That's tribulation, that's judgment, that's the judgment of God, which is to follow the day of Pentecost. In the prophecy of Joel, you see the same thing about Joel talking about, if you look back at Acts chapter 2, Peter is quoting Joel. And uh, verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now those last days, keep in mind, began with the ministry of John the Baptist. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. Romans 15.8 gives a great explanation of what's going on during, this, during the introduction of the last days. God is confirming the promises made unto the fathers. He says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. But you see in the scheme of prophecies there, you have the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Then following that is the day of the Lord. Paul, in Acts 13, consistently, throughout the book of Acts, by the way, followed the same pattern of preaching that the 12 apostles do. And this is where the confusion set in sometime about Paul's Acts ministry. They see Paul reasoning, going into the synagogue, going to the Jew first. They see Paul doing all the, in essence, almost doing all the things that the 12 apostles, and in the book of Acts you have this this contrast between Peter and Paul. Those are the two principles in the book of Acts. And the first part is Peter. And you look at Peter's sermon. And then you go and you look at Paul's sermons. And there is a, a parallel in what they re reference and what they refer to. And it has led some to conclude that, you know, there's no difference in Paul's ministry. Uh, in fact, I, I think, you know, the Acts 2 and the Acts 28 are, are in agreement <laughs> on that point. Um, they don't see anything new with Paul, per se. They see Paul as just simply continuing uh, what the 12 was doing. And when you, again, if you, you look at Paul's apostleship, you look at his sermons, it's almost hard to distinguish, you know, the messages. And look at Acts 13, and, and this is one that I think it would be representative of that idea. Now, th there is a difference. But I think what Peter was doing and what Paul is doing in the book of Acts with regards to the nation of Israel is making it clear that God kept his promise to Israel. Now, in Peter's name, Peter is trying to get them to, to re recognize what Jesus tried to get, get them to recognize. Um, 
You remember Luke chapter 4? I heard someone refer to it earlier this week. Uh, Jesus is in the synagogue. He's given the book of Isaiah. And he begins to, to read from Isaiah 6, I think it was at 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Again, preaching that the kingdom of heaven was what? At hand. He says, but notice verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. This time that God had purpose and determined to favor the nation of Israel. Look at Luke 19. In Luke 19, um, verse 42, uh, Jesus standing over, be, uh, come near, rather, the city of Jerusalem, beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. Um, I was looking for the phrase, the visitation. Okay, yeah, there it is. And so in verse 44, and he talks about, he, he, he tells them about what's coming. And he says, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. But this was the time during the earthly ministry of Christ, during the early Acts period. This was the time for Israel to receive the promises. So, but they rejected them. So Paul gets saved. And guess what he does? He continues that same provoking, the provoking of the nation. But no longer with the view of saving the nation, no longer with the view of saying, this is your day, this is the time of your visitation, this is the time for you to receive the promises made unto the Father. No, they've rejected him. And likewise, God has now rejected them. And Paul's apostleship is a single event that demonstrates that God had cast Israel aside. Not permanently, but he was no longer focused on fulfilling the promises made unto the Father. That time has now been suspended, has been interrupted. Now, what Paul's apostleship signaled was a day of grace, a day of mercy. Rather than ushering in that day of wrath and judgment, Romans 11:30. Through 32 says, God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have what? Mercy upon all. I'm going to try to quickly uh, touch on, uh, read, read some things here in chapter 13, make my point here, what I was driving at. If you start, well, you, you see there in verse 14 down, uh, verse 15, after the reading of the law and the prophets. So what is Paul doing? After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto him, saying, Ye men and brethren, have ye any word of exhortation for the people? Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand and said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience. And he begins to give an account of their history. That leads up to the time of Christ. If you look down at verse 23 of this man's seed, hath God according to his promise raised unto Israel a Savior. That's his first coming. When John had first preached before the coming, the baptism of repentance, now notice, to all the people of Israel. 
And as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye, I, think ye that I am? I'm not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, whosoever among you feared God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Now, Romans 11, 11, and 12 says, I, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, but God forbid, but rather through their fall, what? Salvation is come unto the Gentiles. Now, in, in thinking of salvation in a verse like that, and thinking about what Paul says here, to you is the word of this salvation sent. There's a, a, a broad sense of salvation. You have to have a broader understanding of salvation. You don't want to give any, you don't want to uh, give a technical meaning to salvation in, in these verses. They're, they're, they're general. But like Paul does in Romans chapter 1, like the word gospel of God, he defines it probably in its broadest term when he says concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's the sense in which we are to understand salvation in Romans 11, 11, and 12. Uh, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. The preaching of Christ has come unto the Gentiles. When he talks about, to you is the word of this salvation sent, he, he's just simply talking about the presentation, the preaching of Christ. But there's, when, you get, when Paul begins to talk about Christ, though, you know, we talk about the gospel of God, that's your broader term. Then you talk about the gospel of, of uh, I mean, the gospel of God. But then you talk about the gospel of the kingdom, and you talk about the gospel of grace. Um, they're both gospels of God, but they're not the same gospel. The message, the messages are different. Now, there's a common theme in Paul's preaching of Christ and Peter's preaching of Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That doesn't mean that they're preaching the same gospel. If you're up here on, the, on that broader level, yes. But as you move down into the particulars, there's a, there's a separation. There's a distinction between what Peter is saying about Christ and what Paul is saying about Christ. But there will be that common teaching, that common message that both will say about Christ that they're in perfect and total agreement with, but it doesn't mean that they're preaching the same gospel. Um, real, real quick here, uh, look at, um, so he says, to you is the word of this salvation sent. And so he begins to go through the earthly ministry of Christ there. And then you get down to, um, Verse 30, but God, you know, you have the death, the burial, then you have the resurrection, verse 30, but God is raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. That's the Acts, the early Acts period. But now notice what Paul said. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which God, which was made unto who? which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled them, hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second son, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Confirming the fact that God kept his promise. You remember in Romans 9, what's, the, what's the, uh, the question? Is there unrighteousness with God? Why? Because if God has a new agency, then God didn't keep his word to Israel. That's the argument. Peter argues that God kept his word. Paul is arguing God kept 
his word. What is the proof that God kept his word? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You notice, as con and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, no, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. He says, I will give you. You remember the question in Acts 1, 6? Wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which God has placed in his own hand. But one thing Israel could be assured of, God would fulfill his promise to them. He will keep his word to them. And the resurrection was to prove. Remember over there in 1 Peter, we begot, we've been begotten again unto what? A lively hope. Like after the crucifixion itself, I gotta quit. But like after the crucifixion itself, um, the two on the road to Emmaus said, We had hoped that it had been he that should have redeemed. They had lost all hope. Jesus, showing himself alive by many infallible proofs, restored their hope. Those who had went into hiding as a result of the fear of the Jews were now preaching boldly in the temple. Um, the resurrection was the issue. But because Israel had rejected it, God now ushered in his hidden purpose, the mystery. Signaled by the revelation of Jesus Christ to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And through Paul, confirmed that, yes, I kept my promise. But because you, as Acts 13, I wanted to do more in there, but, but because you count yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul's apostleship to the Gentiles was the provoking of Israel to jealousy provoking them that, to get saved in spite of the fact that God had cast them away as a nation, but they individually could be saved. But by emulating the Gentile. All right, I gotta quit. I, more, always more to say, but. <laughs> That provoking ministry that Paul has in his Acts ministry is the, is the key to understanding why he does a lot of things that he does. All those Jewish things that he does, and part of the program that was there before him is to provoke the body of Christ is made up of Jew and Gentile, lost Jews, lost Gentiles, to put them in one body. He does some things that tells God hadn't, God's left Israel and gone to the Gentiles. That's the answer to the charismatic craziness it's the answer to people that don't understand how to rightly divide the word, even if they're mid-Acts dispensationalists, the 28ers and stuff. I have a, all that O'Hare stuff out there. I, someone gave me a, a tape of Mr. O'Hare. He was 76 years old, preaching in Burt Baker's church in Grand Rapids, means about 1950. And if you're familiar with O'Hare's ministry in the early, there was a period of time when he considered the Acts 28 movement doctrine and he backed off from it. And in this tape, he says, it would be better to be Acts 2 than Acts 28. And I thought, well, that's a bold statement, but it's true. Because when you're Acts 28, you, you get rid of about two-thirds of Paul's epistles. You know, and uh, you don't want to do that. All right, we're going to take a break. You've got about three minutes. You don't have long, so don't, don't go anywhere, okay? Just stand up and stretch, and we'll get, we'll get, go, get ourselves going in the next session. You hear the music.